I think the fair thing to do would be to ban the Alabama Crimson Tide from the film room, the practice field, the football field, everything until August 31st when they kick off the 2013 season against Virginia Tech and see if possibly that would even things out and make it a fair and even playing field for the upcoming football season. Mark Rogers TV continuing our series on spring football. We've looked at LSU, Wisconsin, Ohio State, and now we take it all the way to the top to the Alabama Crimson Tide. And we love college football. We watch a ton. But if we want to do it right here on Mark Rogers TV, when we talk the Crimson Tide, we take it to WDGM's Ben George. Ben, we appreciate you jumping on board with us and providing the expert knowledge on the Crimson Tide as they started spring practice uh, just about a week ago. Maybe it's been a couple weeks now that the Tide's been on the field. And the thing that really struck me following the BCS National Championship game, in which, of course, they dominated Notre Dame 42-14, was that Nick Saban said after the game, hey, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to really savor it for 24 hours. And then it's back to work, back in assembling the 2013 edition. So Nick Saban, we know he's been working for quite a long time, but uh, the entire football team back at it now. Yeah, now we, now we've transitioned since the last time I talked to you and we talked recruiting. We've transitioned back to the field now. We can uh, get in full-on football mode. Now that basketball's over, the NIT's put behind us, we can start focusing on football. But yeah, it, like you said, they, they, they took the practice field March 16th, a couple Saturdays ago. Uh, on spring break this week, so they only have a few practices under their belt. The majority of the spring football practices will uh, start back up on Monday and happen through April 20th. But so far, so good uh, for Alabama. Yeah, I'm looking at the Tide coming back in uh, 2013 based on the depth chart. They've got 13 starters coming back, uh, split pretty evenly between the offense and the defense. That offensive line was devastating uh, all season, but specifically very impressive against uh, the Notre Dame front seven in the BCS championship game and a game before that in dominating Georgia on the ground in the second half when Eddie Lacy and TJ Yeldon went uh, berserk in that second half and dominating the ground game. Of course, Barrett Jones, Chance Warmack, and DJ Fluker are off to the NFL we expect Bama to reload, but we know that the continuity is very important along the offensive line. Who are some of those guys that we can be expecting to step into those huge shoes in 2013? Well, they had a couple guys um, back, like you mentioned, Quanjo and Anthony Steen are back there anchoring the line. Um, and they got a few guys that are going to step up. Ryan Kelly, a guy from Ohio, uh, your neck of the woods, Mark, originally. He's uh, looking to fill in that role at the center behind uh, replacing Barrett Jones. He's had a lot of reps there. He's been in the program a couple of years, so uh, he might not have extensive experience on the field and game action, but uh, he's a guy that Barrett himself has told us here at uh, 991 a couple of times we've had him on that he fully expects Ryan Kelly to be as good or better than he was at center. Now, granted, Barrett Jones also played the entire offensive line, so we're not going to make a comparison with him exactly, but that's always good when you have a guy that can, uh, can step up like that. They also have a couple of junior college transfers, uh, that came in here in the early class, uh, Leon Brown, who was out of uh, New York. He's uh, made a little bit of an impression so far. Also, Brandon Hill, a big guy who uh, originally signed with Alabama, was considering Ole Miss and then ended up signing with Alabama this uh, this spring. But he he looks pretty good. He's a huge kid. Came in at like three, almost close to 380, I believe. And he's lost a little bit of weight, but he's got good feet and uh, looks to make an impact. But they have a few guys they can rotate in. I mean, Saban has done a good job bringing in three, four offensive linemen every year. So they've kind of stockpiled there. It's just a matter of experience. Now, looking at uh, the quarterback position, it appears as though A.J. McCarron seems to be entrenched as the starter. Don't know that I really understand that. Don't know what the guy's really proven <laughs> over the past few seasons, but they, they look to be looking at the backup position, seem to be pretty comfortable with McCarron. So in regards to we know uh, what happens in the game of football, that you have to be strong at the backup position, not that they've had to be the past couple years, but you're only one play away from going to that backup. So what does the backup uh, quarterback situation look like uh, there in Tuscaloosa? You know, you're obviously in a good position when one of the bigger – uh, positions you're eyeing for spring as your backup quarterback. I mean, that's how things are right now, but it is important because last year was even more so. I mean, if McCarron had gone down and he did get banged up a little bit um, and was kind of playing hurt down the stretch, they had they had some question marks. I mean, they got Blake Sims, a guy who's a, is a mobile quarterback, ran, ran a lot of wildcat when he was in as a backup in cleanup duty. 
Um, but you have a couple other names. Alec Morris was a freshman last year. He got redshirted. There was some speculation that he would have been the guy that stepped in last year as a freshman had McCarron gone down for the season. Um, so he's there. Also, Cooper Bateman, a kid that came in. We talked about previously on the recruiting uh, show we did that he came in from Utah, big kid. He was a little shaky early on in the first couple of practices, but he's starting to make some better throws now. Looks like he could be a guy. But, again, you have two guys that haven't played in game action. They're both young. Um, so it's still a huge question mark. But as long as they have that settled coming out of spring and, and have that comfortable feeling that if McCarron does go down, they can pop somebody in, um, it's going to be a, a big plus for them. But they got weapons all around them, so it's going to be hard to fail if they, if they did have to come into that position. Andy Lacey's gone to the NFL. T.J. Yeldon, of course, almost was at a spot where he was splitting carries with uh, Lacey last season, and T.J. Yeldon stepped up the biggest way in the biggest games, looking at the championship game with over 100 yards. Same thing in the SEC title game and that close one against Georgia and really just out of the gate against Michigan in that huge matchup to open the season. Uh, we did a video post here on Mark Rogers TV with the top 10 returning running backs in college football I ranked T.J. Yeldon based on the performance I had seen in the stat sheet as the top running back coming back in college football. I got a lot of pushback specifically from Georgia fans, as you can imagine, uh, with that two-headed monster and especially uh, what Todd Gurley did last season in rushing for 1,700 yards. But Yeldon at 1,100 on the ground and uh, maybe the biggest play of the season was through the air and the flip pass uh, – off to the left flat against LSU where he took it in for the game-winning touchdown. So T.J. Yeldon uh, looks to be entrenched as the starter, but again, at Bama, there's all sorts of incoming talent all over the place, so size up the running back uh, position for us. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that Georgia conversation. This is, it reminds me a lot of the Julio versus A.J. Green. They came in the same year, and both fans argued as to who was better. Who cares? They both produce. They're going to produce at an all-pro level. It's probably the same thing with these two running backs. But first, um, obviously, T.J. Yeldon is a guy coming in. Um, they have a couple of different options behind him. Kenyon Drake, a guy that played, again, cleanup duty, was basically the third running back last year uh, after a couple injuries. He's got some potential. I, lo I love the way he runs, honestly. He, he real quick guy, good, good hands, and made the best of his opportunities when he had him. But behind that, you have Derrick Henry, who if you go in and see some of the pictures from spring practice so far, Guy looks like he's a little bit of a clone of, of Trent Richardson. He's wearing number three. He's got the dress coming out the back. Big physical kid. The only difference is he's 6'3", 230, as opposed to Trent, who was right around 5'11". So bigger back, there's a lot of question on whether or not that bigger back would fit in the system. Um, he's had some shakiness with his hands in the first few practices, but, again, it's only been a couple practices here. Um, but he's the guy that looks to carry the load. But they also have three other guys coming in. Um, that also can carry with Tyron Jones from Georgia. Alti Tenpenny is another guy that was actually at practice uh, a week ago, kind of just keeping an eye on things, seeing how things were going, kind of see how the practice regime goes. Um, he's another guy that could step in. So they have a lot of guys that will be young, but we've seen in this system that Saban doesn't put a lot of pressure on him. He gives him carries when he needs to, gives his main guy a break, and they come in and they flourish behind that offensive line, especially on a, against a worn-down defense. Defensively for the Tide last season, they led the nation in scoring defense, rushing defense, and total defense. Uh, the 2011 edition was one of the better defenses we've seen in major college football in the past 20 or 25 seasons. They were expect to, expected to take a step back uh, on defense last fall, and they probably did. Georgia certainly had their way at times in the SEC championship game, and it didn't appear as though that defense made as many big plays, didn't make as many plays in the backfield. But, again, bottom line, it's a BCS national championship, a dominating performance in that game, and then straight across the board leading the, the nation in total defense and in rushing defense and scoring defense. That speaks volumes of what the, the recruiting and the backup situation and the depth is like at Alabama when you lose the type of talent they lost in that 2012 NFL draft. So we've got the defense coming back with, uh, I've got a listed seven starters, Ben. Yeah, defense defenses should be pretty stout. Uh, the, the big question mark, again, is on the line. It's the line on both sides of the ball. Um, good thing is they run a 3-4, so they don't have to have a, a, a big playmaker there. Basically need guys that can fill the gaps, hold up the line, let the linebackers play. And this linebacking core is going to be outstanding this year, uh, behind C.J. Mosley especially. Um, but they have a little more experience in the, in the defensive backfield. D. Milner leaves. He's going to be a, probably a, a first 
first round top 10 pick in the NFL draft um, as he ran about a 4-3 at the combine. So that's a big loss. But they have uh, some other guys, uh, Dion Ballou, who was a junior college kid coming in last year. He looked lost at times. You can see the talent, the raw talent, but he needs a little bit more uh, work to, to kind of be that main guy that he, Saban's had the last couple of years. Uh, and Geno Smith, it was a true freshman last year, really came along down the stretch, made some big plays in the Georgia game. SEC championship, so he's a guy that can step in. But safety, they have two great safeties. Uh, they lose Robert Lester, but they have a kid, Landon Collins, who played mainly special teams last year. You probably remember him from uh, the All-American game when he committed to Alabama there, and then his mom was like, nah, you're going to LSU. Got it cleared up. Family's on the same page now, but he'll be back there along with HaHa Clinton Dix. Uh, so there's a little question mark up front. There's some big, some big bodies that are ready to step in. Can they be as effective as Jesse Williams, who was running a 4-7, 4-8? Uh, I don't know. But they, they, if they do enough, everybody behind them uh, will, will take care of business. Yeah, as you mentioned, the loss of Jesse Williams at nose tackle is huge. Uh, Damian Square, Quentin Dial on the ends a little bit to a lesser degree in my estimation, but uh, Alabama reloads along the defensive uh, front there as well. Ben, uh, if there's any concern for this football team, if you could pinpoint one thing that has any bit of worry uh, possibly heading into the Virginia Tech game, what would that be? Bit of worry. I mean, for <laughs> me, it's just it's the offensive line. I mean, the offensive line, and, and we've and failed to mention that, you know, I, most people know that Mario Cristobal came in, who's, who's taken over. He was the head coach down in, in Florida, Florida Atlantic, I believe, for a little while, and then actually went to Miami with, as an assistant for about a month before Saban came and uh, – plucked him away and brought him up to coach the offensive line. So he brings a lot of experience in, um, and he's got some work to do. But that's that's it. you got to protect McCarron because if they can give him protection, uh, this offense could be as good as, as Saban's ever put together. they got weapons on the outside. Um, things are going so well right now that, you know, Saban likes to experiment in spring practice, kind of move guys around, give him experience in other positions in case an emergency happens. Well, he's taken one running back. He was a five-star a year ago, DeHart. He's taken two uh, wide receivers, uh, one Christian Jones, who made a number of plays uh, as a freshman and sophomore. They moved those guys to defensive back to try to mess, give them a little, a little work there. So that's how deep they are when you're able to move a five-star running back over to defense and also a couple of receivers that have, have produced a little bit early in their career. Um, so the weapons are all there, but they got to they got to solidify that offensive line because they do have a couple of tests early with Virginia Tech, who I think. Should be a fairly easy game for them uh, as far as opening games against bigger name opponents go. But then Texas A&M uh, is right behind them, and that's obviously the game that they gotta, uh, they'll got they have on their calendar the entire summer and will probably set the tone for the SEC conference. As Ben mentions, it all gets started for the Crimson Tide August 31st against Virginia Tech. The A-Day Alabama spring football game comes up on April the 20th. Now we invite you to join us in on the discussion with your comments on the Alabama Crimson Tide and the forecast for 2013. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and expertise, and we'll see you next time on Mark Rogers TV. Thank you, Mark. Anytime.